This is a summary of this is a summary of Max Tegmark's Life 3.0. It's part one anyway. Okay, and he, he says it's basically welcome to the most important conversation of our time. And he says that you know for 10 billion years, you know the the, the galaxy was really without meaning. He calls it a zombie. A, uh, they're just with, and then all of a sudden all, along came this bacteria on this planet Earth, and we we had the beginnings of life and the beginning of the possibility of meaning. So he talked about life 1.0 in the first part, and he talks about life 1.0, and he says it's can it survive and can it replicate? That's what basically he, he is the criteria that he's established for life 1.0, and the life 1.0 really exists for everything from bacteria all the way through to the to to the, the animal kingdom and to all the other animals, and it's a scale. I mean, there's different levels of it, right? And and then he, in different levels of complexity of that life. But can it design its own software? He basically says no. That's one of the, the, the negatives on Life 1.0. But then about 70,000 years ago, he identifies the beginning of Life 2.0. And that was when, when all of a sudden along came Sapiens with, with some of his early technologies. And, and Sapiens at Life 2.0, you know, you know, not only could Sapiens survive and certainly replicate, but, but the, the uh, species Sapiens also had the capability to actually design some of its own software. And he gets a little bit into that, right? And he talks about how in designing its own software, what we see is we see, so we see cooperation between all the different people. We see the building of significant technologies. We see writing and we see transportation systems and, the, and getting around the world. All of these things basically be created what we call our culture and, and, and what a Harari calls our myths. Right? And this is the example of some of our myths. But then the next question he looks at is, can it design its own hardware, right? And he says no, basically, for Life 1.0 and Life 2.0. But the whole book is really about this section of Life 2.0 from, from where we are today and moving through to look at what are some of the possibilities of Life 3.0. And he says the, the thing Life 3.0, it's, it's not really about a robot, but it's really about, if you think about it, it's about the ability since it has to be able to replicate, it's where, where technology can actually also survive and replicate itself. And so that, that's what he's calling Life 3.0. Certainly it can design right now, we're already seeing is a capability to design its own software and some of the unique things we're seeing with something like Google Translate. And can it design its own hardware? And so the projection is that in the future, we will be able to, with, with cyborgs and, and, and with some of the uh, interconnected technology, so we, it will be able to design its own hardware. And that's a lot about what Life 3.0 and the book is all about. One thing to look at is that Life 3.0, not only is it is it wider, but it but also is deeper, right? But there's a lot of, I mean, it's full of a lot of question marks as to what Life 3.0 is going to be all about. One of the things that a, uh, he then kind of puts everything into definitions so we have something to work with. And so he says, well, let's start with the definitions of, of, of what is life. And so he talks about how life is basically the process that can retain its complexity and replicate. That's his definition of life. And if you look at DNA, DNA is a copy of what it wants to make. It's not all the material. So it's a, it can, life 1.0 is a little different, all right? That's life that evolves its hardware and software. It's the biological state. Life 2.0 is basically life that evolves its hardware, but still designs much of its software. It's the culture. Life 3.0 is life that actually designs its hardware and software. That's the technological stage, he calls it. And one of the things he's looking at in, 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 for him for is, is where we can live for a million years or, or something can live for a million years. It can travel without spacecraft and it can understand all known science. Those are kind of three of the criteria that he throws out there. Then in the rest of that, this chapter, he kind of puts together some charts and, and what he calls his, the, 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 his uh, tree, which we'll get into. In, in the, let's look at some of those examples. One of the charts he talks about is this kind of heat chart, which is, which is about a, uh, it's a, it's a questionnaire of if superhuman AI appears, will it be a good thing? Definitely bad, probably bad, highly uncertain, probably good, and definitely good is over there in the green. The next question, the other side of that is, will AI surpass human level, right? And so in a few years, when will it? In a few decades, in 50 years, in 100 years, in 300 years, or never? So he takes this and, and, and kind of builds a chart for of, of what people have say about it. 
and he, he gives them kind of names. So you, the, the virtually nobody is down there saying it's going, all this is going to happen in a few years. Luddites say that it's going to happen, but it's definitely bad. The beneficial AI movement kind of moves between bad and good with regards to a, what's going to happen over time in less than 100 years. And the technical skeptics are really the ones who say it's going to be greater than 100 years and some never. So then he goes, well, okay, let's look at what are the myths. One of the big myths is that superintelligence by 2100 is inevitable, and the other is superintelligence by 2100 is impossible. And he says it may happen in decades, centuries, or never, but the AI experts disagree and we simply don't know. The next myth is only Luddites worry about AI, and the fact is that many top AI researchers are still concerned about artificial intelligence and what's going and what's happening. The next thing he talks about is the mythic, he calls it the mythical worry of will AI turn evil and will AI be uh, turn conscious? And the actual worry is, is, not, is AI being competent with goals that are misaligned with ours. So it's not necessarily consciousness is the issue. The other thing is our robots are the concern. Really, it's misaligned intelligence is the main concern. It needs no body, only an internet connection. Then AI can't control humans is the myth. Because intelligence enables control. We control tigers by being smarter. So intelligence is what gives us the capability to control. Another myth is that machines can't have goals. Well, the fact is that a heat-seeking missile has a goal. And, and so that, that machines actually can have goals. The mythical worry is that superintelligence is just years away. And it's kind of a panic button there, right? But the actual worry is that it's at least decades away, but it may take that long to make it safe. And something to think about when you're talking about things that are decades away is that you know if, if our children are going to live to be 142 years old or our grandchildren, it, it, it's, it's going to be in their lifetime. So it still is a challenge. So then what he does is kind of outlines what he's going to talk about in the rest of the book. And so, so he starts to talk about you know what are the growing impact of AI on the economy. So he talks about basic big air, four air, big areas. Weapons, should we start a military arms race? Bugs, how can we make AI more robust and less hackable? Laws, how should laws handle autonomous systems? And jobs, which jobs get automated first? And which careers should kids pursue? Those are some of the things that he looks at. Then he gets into the human level AGI, which is how can we make low employment work for us, right? The other is super intelligence anytime soon. How can we make intelligence beneficial? And how can intelligence explosion happen? So how is this possible? How is AI contained and controlled? How do we align the AI with, our, our, with ours and whose goals do we align it with? And how do we keep AI contained? And then he looked at three options. One is that the humans will be in charge. The other is that the cyborgs will be in charge. And the last one is that the AI itself will be in charge. When he gets to the top of the tree, this is, the speculation is getting higher here, right? So how, how, how do we speculate how humans will be treated uh, yeah, if they were treated well? Then the kind of the definition is that that's what we call friendly AI. If we get replaced, you know, then, then we get replaced because AI is perceived as worthy, a worthy descendant, right? It's sharing our values, et cetera. However, we could also get replaced in a kind of a negative fashion, if you will, where AI is perceived as the conquerors and they conquer us. And that is if badly is how humans will be treated. Badly as AI is perceived as the conquerors. He then kind of looks at two big questions at the very end of the book. And one is, can very long-term goals and ethical considerations be sensibly discussed? And the other one is, do some AIs have subjective consciousness experience? And is that it's even relevant? Does an AI need to have subjective conscious experience? And why does it matter? And these are the questions that we're going to look at as we look into the rest of the other parts of Tagmark's book. Thank you.